Hey, come on, Merry Christmas, Go Church family. How you feel today? You look great, by the way. Anybody thankful for Christmas? Come on, tis the season. You know, here in the Atlanta area, I don't know if we'll get snow, but we got some rain this morning. How about that? So glad you made it safe. It's so great to see all of you right here at our broadcast campus on the south side of Atlanta. I also want to look in the cameras in the back of the room, say good morning, and God bless you to our West Side Atlanta campus on the amazing property of City of Refuge. We greet all of you. And then also our Montgomery County, Maryland campus, 700 miles from here, we say Merry Christmas to you. And then everybody watching online. So whatever location you're a part of, whatever campus you call home here at Go Church, can we put our hands together? Come on, let's greet one another today. Come on, come on, come on. I love it. Hey, how about this? While you're in the, uh, the clapping spirit, Let's give some honor and appreciation to all of our military men and women first responders. Come on, if that's you, would you put your hand up? Let's honor you today, veterans, active duty. Come on, first respond. Come on, clap a little bit better. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Love all of you. We have a lot of great things happening here at Go Church as we close out one calendar year and we enter into a new calendar year. I know you heard a bunch of the exciting upcoming events in the video announcements a moment ago, you can always go on the Go Church app uh, to see all of the activities and events happening at your campus. You can go online. So I don't want to be redundant, but I do want to highlight just a couple of things. Uh, beginning January 1, we're going to kick off our 21 days of prayer and fasting. We call that Deeper 21. And every morning during the 21 days, your campus will come together for a time of devotion and worship and prayer. And so I'm asking you to be a part of the prayer time and the fasting time. And, it's, and we'll give you more information, but Deeper 21, it's the most important, significant thing we do as a church family to begin the year with prayer and fasting. Can I get an amen there? All right, and then as you know, we're right in the middle of our annual legacy offering. I'm excited to tell you that God is really blessing this offering. This is a, a, the only special offering that we do all year long. It's the one, one offering where we're asking you to go above and beyond your typical giving. And here's why because every penny that comes in, we're giving it all away. Come on, can you say amen to that? We're giving it 100% what comes in, we're giving it away. We're giving it to our five legacy lanes. So 100% of what you give will go towards local outreach, national missions, world missions, the next generation, and special projects. So as you participate in the legacy offering, just make sure that you, you memo or highlight your giving towards legacy. So that can be accounted. And then on Vision Sunday in February, the first Sunday in February, I'll share with you the grand total of the legacy offering. The three things I want you to do with the legacy offering, pray, plan, participate, all right? And we'll come back at the beginning of the year and celebrate what the Lord has done and is doing through the legacy offering. And then the most uh, soonest event, the soonest event that's happening is Christmas Eve. Come on, Christmas Eve, right here at Go Church. I know a lot of you got travel plans, you got family coming in, or you're going to see family. I'm praying for y'all, by the way. Come on, somebody. Love your family, but how many got a little crazy in your family? Come on, got a little crazy. And if you're wondering, who's, who's the crazy person in my family? It's you. Come on now, that's you. But as you get together with your family, you got your traditions, make, make church, make a Christmas Eve gathering a part of those traditions. Even if you travel away, find a good local church on Christmas Eve just to celebrate uh, the birth of Jesus Christ. We've got, uh, we've got so many gatherings happening at all of our campuses. And in order to accommodate so many people that will be here, we've got free tickets, all right, at your campus. So on your way out today, make sure you stop by Next Steps. You take as many free tickets as you would like. If you end up not having a ticket, you can still show up. There may not have been room in the end for Jesus, but we'll make room for you here at Go Church. Come on, somebody. So we want you to come and participate, but if you'll take tickets, that will let us see how the crowd is going so we can redirect people to the other gatherings at all of our campuses. So a lot of things that are happening, all right? I wanna pray for you today. I also wanna invite you to uh, take some notes. There's a message note card and a seat back that's right near you or in front of you. We're gonna do a little mini series here over the next couple Sundays. Just talk a little bit about the purpose of Christmas. What is Christmas all about? We always try to do a Christmas teaching or series in the month of December and I think the Lord has given me a, a very simple elementary word, but, but a reminder, and that's what we need. What is the season? What is Christmas truly all about? So as we jump into that together, let's start with prayer. Every head bowed, every eye closed. You pray for me, I'm gonna pray for you. First though, let's take about 10 seconds and just uh, 
clear away the distractions and the busyness, all the, the thoughts that are racing through your mind and heart. We got 35 minutes together here. Um, if the Holy Spirit is here, which we know he is, and if you're here, which we know you are, then let's invite him to do a great work in us, all right? 10 seconds, you align your heart and thoughts with the Lord, invite him to speak to you, and then after 10 seconds, I'll offer a corporate prayer. Here we go. Thank you, Jesus. We give you all glory and we give you all honor. Lord, I thank you for your sweet Holy Spirit. Lord, all day I have just felt your presence here and I am so grateful. Lord, in everything we do today, I pray that you would receive the highest honor and the highest glory. Nothing that we do as a church family should be with any intention of self-promotion or gain. But the Bible says that if we lift you up, you'll draw people to you. And I pray you do that. I know you will. Your word never returns void. Just draw all the people to you. Lord, even in the simplicity of this sermon, I pray that people are encouraged. That's a word that you put on my heart in preparation of these next couple of Sundays to encourage your people with good news. So let it be that today. All right, we give you honor and we give you glory and we magnify you, Jesus. There is no name like the name of Jesus. Come on. And together, everybody said amen and amen. Now let's bless the Lord together. Come on, we've clapped for a lot of people, but none greater than King Jesus. Love it. Are you like me? You love Christmas? Come on, where are you at, Christmas lovers? Some of you, some of you, you you're on the other end. You, you, you don't enjoy Christmas and the busyness and the shopping and the food and the parties and all of that. But I think of being married to, to Kimberly now for 19 years, uh, either I have to love Christmas or she's gonna leave me. Come on, somebody. So, you know, whether you have one tree up in your house or 10 Christmas trees like us, uh, just celebrate Christmas and, and enjoy all the festivities and activities that come along with this season. But but don't ever lose sight of the purpose of Christmas. And I think if you're like us, a lot of times, you know, uh, Christmas seems to revolve around that perfect gift. Now, don't get me wrong. I hope to wake up on Christmas and my family has not forgotten me. Can I get an amen from somebody? Like, I mean, I'm paying for all their stuff. The least they could do is buy me a gift. Come on, come on, dads, where are you at? Like, show me some love a little bit. So I, I submitted my Amazon wish list to Kimberly and to my mother-in-love, Dr. Valerie. And, and my hope is if Kimberly doesn't get it for me, my mother-in-love will. Come on, so I got backup. <laughs> but I'll never forget the best Christmas gift I got. I was uh, maybe eight or nine years old. And many of you know this, but I grew up in Tampa, Florida. But, but really, I, I didn't get uh, into Tampa until I was a teenager. But those first few years of my life, I lived in Plant City, Florida. My brother's a strawberry farmer. I mean, he's got a couple hundred acres of, of, of strawberries that he farms. And, and I really didn't even grow up in Plant City. I grew up in Dover, which is like the, the country of Plant City. And I grew up on this long dirt road, Feetsway Road in Dover, Florida. And this one Christmas at eight or nine years old, I had submitted my Christmas list to my mom and dad. All I wanted was a bicycle. That's all I wanted was a bike. All the other little kids on our little dirt road, they, they were asking for bikes, and so I, I just wanted a bike. So I woke up on Christmas morning, you know, as a little kid, excited to walk down and see the Christmas tree and the presents, and, you know, and to see that bicycle. When I walked down that Christmas morning, there, there was no bike, and immediately I was like, my family hates me. They don't love me. They wish I was never born. And we sat there, we opened up all these gifts, and my little heart was broken. And I was so disappointed because the one gift that I wanted, I, I never even got. And then my dad said something that I think every child, well, as a matter of fact, I think every grown up, you just love these words. There's one more gift. Come on, so aren't those like the best words? There's one more gift. So I stood up and y'all, I knew, like I'm about to get this bicycle. This is my moment. I have arrived. They are going to show me how much they love me because they got the bike. My dad blindfolds me. He takes me outside. I can see it now. How many of you, you remember your childhood home? And when you were a kid, didn't that house seem so big? And then like when you go back as an adult, you know, for most of us, come on, it's like really, really small. But I remember him opening the, I could hear him opening the sliding glass door. I'm blindfolded. He takes me out into the front yard. And I thought this yard was so big. And it's kind of like this big countdown, three, two, one. 
He takes off the blindfold, and right there in the front yard is the brightest blue go-kart I had ever seen. I didn't even know what it was. So I was like, what is this? And my dad said, it's a go-kart. And I was like, what is that? And he told me all about the go-kart. And, and of course, you've seen the, the Christmas story where, where Ralphie wants the gun, and what does his mom say? You'll shoot your... Uh, so I can hear my mom, Dorothy, saying to my dad, Don, JC's gonna kill himself. He doesn't even know what it is. And he's like, he'll be fine. Just get on there and go. Remember those days of parenting, like you cared, but you didn't care? It's like, get on it and learn the hard way. He needs to wreck. It builds character. One good flip will teach him a lesson, you know? So here I, I get on the go-kart. The go I crank it up, and I'm on this go-kart, and, and I get out on Feetsway Road. Man, and I, I literally, I, I have that thing wide open. I mean, at max speed, I'm doing probably four or five miles an hour. And I mean, I'm just, I'm hauling it, y'all. The, the, the dirt is coming up from those tires. And all of a sudden, around the corner, true story, I see a group of four or five boys on Christmas morning riding their, <laughs> their bicycles. It was so cute. And I'm telling you the truth, man, I think Jesus took the will because I had never been on a go-kart before, but all of a sudden, man, that thing ramped up. Those boys are coming at me, and I can see their face like, what is that? And man, I got close to them. They got close to me. I, I hit those brakes. I turned that wheel, and dust just flew up all over them. And I'm sitting here like this. I'm like, sup? <laughs> you know, I thought I was so cool. They were like, what is that? I was like, you don't know? It's a go-kart. Who got you that? My daddy gave it to me. I'll never forget the words of my dad. Uh, and that, that gift really became super special to me because a few years later, uh, he passed away from a heart attack. And so I, I just always remember those words because I said, Dad, I, I asked for a bicycle. And you gave me a go-kart. And he said this, because you're not like everybody else. You're different. And that Christmas became the best Christmas gift I'd ever been given. Until I turned 19 and I accepted Jesus as my Lord and Savior. And the encouragement of this message today really is to understand that the best Christmas gift that we will ever be given is far greater than a go-kart. It's far greater than whatever, whatever is on your Amazon wish list. It's far greater than that new iPhone or that new Apple Watch or those new J's. I know some of you are hoping for a December to remember and maybe you want a Lexus or maybe you're just like me and I'm just hoping we can afford some groceries. Come on, somebody. God's gift, his son Jesus, salvation, is the greatest Christmas gift that you could ever receive. And there is no earthly gift that could ever compare to this eternal gift. And I'll tell you this much, until you accept this gift, Christ as your Lord and Savior, you will always try to find joy and value in the things of this world. And, and, and you know this, this is either your testimony or you know other people like this. Let, so listen to me, stuff does not make you happy. Things do not bring you joy. Now the irony in all of this is that the gifts and the presents and the, the dancing and the singing, all of that is really a part of the celebration of Christmas. But the best gift is Jesus. Can I get an amen right there? Now, I'm sure there's a lot of different reasons that we could talk about that makes this Christmas gift, salvation and grace and mercy, you know, so special and so unique. But I thought about three that I wanted to just talk to you about for a moment. Uh, the first reason I think this gift is so special is because it, it's the most expensive gift that we'll ever get. Now, again, some of those gifts that are on your list, they're, they're, they're of great value, but this gift is priceless. Jesus gave his life for you. Think about that. It's a priceless gift, but not only is it priceless, but it's also eternal. This is the only gift, the gift of salvation, God's grace, his son, that will last forever. Now, I just told you the story, the, the, the most special Christmas gift I've ever received and you know where that go-kart is today? Probably rusting in a junkyard somewhere. But, but God's gift, his son and salvation, it, it lasts forever. It goes on and on and on. And then thirdly, not, not only is it priceless and eternal, but it's practical. Now the Bible says you work out your own salvation and, and you can use this gift every single day of your life. It's always interesting how much stress and money and time and attention we put into buying that special someone, that 
most perfect gift only for some months or years later for it to be set to the side and for the latest and greatest gadget or thing to replace it. That's not how it works with Jesus. Jesus is the greatest. And, and his love for you, his grace for you, his comfort for you, his strength for you, it never grows old and it never goes out of date. That's a great place to say amen right there. Anybody grateful for the greatest Christmas gift? Come on, it's Jesus. Let me show you this story. Let me show you the Christmas story here in Luke chapter two. I'll give you verses eight through 14 uh, today and then next Sunday. And then if you're a, a part of our Christmas Eve gathering, we'll pick up the next few verses on, on Christmas Eve. But I wanna show you these few verses here as we unpack uh, Luke's perspective of, of the birth of Jesus. Here's what he writes, beginning in verse number eight. There were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. Verse nine, an angel of the Lord appeared to them and the glory of the Lord shone around them and, and, they, and they were terrified, I think rightly so. I mean, if, if an angel just showed up in front of you, you might be a little bit like, oh. I think it's a holy reverent fear though. And the angel said to them, recognizing their state of like, fear, don't be afraid, I bring you good news. Just a question, anybody here, you need a little good news today? It's me too. This good news will cause great joy. All right, who's that? You need a little joy. And for all people, doesn't matter about race, gender, socioeconomic background, age, this good news will bring great joy and it's for anyone from anywhere. Verse 11, for today in the town of David, a savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. And this will be a sign to you that, that you'll find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel. So now there's a, a, a choir, right? And they did two things. They began to praise God and then they spoke these words as recorded in Luke chapter two, verse 14, which is the next verse. Now, I mean, I've got two kids, Lake is 13 now, and uh, on Thanksgiving day, uh, we measured in height, and he finally outgrew me. So he's 13, he's taller than me, and so my immediate response was, I just tackled him and put him on the ground, <laughs> just to simply remind him, I'm still your daddy. Come on, somebody. And then London is eight years old, and she's kind of the opposite end of the spectrum, so Lake is, is really tall, and she's, she's a little cute, little cuddly thing. Um, both of them constantly remind me that the older I get, the older I become. Like not just in age and gray hair, but you know, just the way that I look at people and Lake is in this mood of taking pictures of me doing old man things. <laughs> God, how many of you know what I'm talking about? So like the other day I was just reading a book and I just couldn't see it, so I just put my glasses down a little bit like that and then he took a picture of that. They also remind me that my dad jokes just aren't funny. and They're actually very cheesy and very corny. However, I'll tell you, y'all, I'm funny. I don't care, I am funny. And I write all my own material. Come on, somebody. And I tell Lake, you are my material. You are what makes me funny. So at the risk of being cheesy and corny and my kids making fun of me for you know, getting the crowd involved, this morning I thought, what if we did both of these things? What if we took just a moment and we just praised God? Just simply for his love for us, for his goodness towards us, because he is sovereign, because he is faithful, because even when we went through seasons of suffering, he never failed us, he never let us down. That God's blessing is on your life, that if you just pause for a moment and you get your eyes off of the things that you see, there's a lot of stuff that you see, but you just, you just really pause to consider all you've been through, all the stuff you've walked through, and yet here you are? Come on, somebody. Like, I like to, I like to tell the devil, you should have killed me while you had a chance. Come on, somebody. Like, but God is so faithful, and he is good. And let me tell you, while I don't know all of your stories, I can say this confidently, you are blessed. You are tremendously blessed. So what if, again, this may seem a little cheesy, but I'm, I'm, I'm in it now. Come on. What if for like 10 seconds, we just praise God together? Come on, can we do that at every campus? Come on, because he really is like the best gift. Come on, if you got one thing to be thankful for, come on. If there's one area in your life where God has just been good to you, 
Come on, he is good. He is faithful. Come on, five more seconds. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, and all that is within me. Come on, bless his holy name. Hallelujah, Jesus. Yeah. All right, fist bump, two or three people. Tell them, say, God is good all the time. And all the time, God is good. He is good. He really is good. So they begin to praise God, and then this is what they said. You ready? This is the second part. On three, let's read it. Every campus, one, two, three. Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth. Peace to those on whom favor rests. Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth. Peace. Anybody need some peace? To those on whom is favor. How about favor? That's me. Rest. So when I read those verses, what, what is the purpose of Christmas? Why, why do we do all of this? Has Christmas become commercialized? Absolutely. I mean, no doubt about it. I mean, they, you go into, you know, uh, Target or, you know, the Walmart. Come on, somebody. And uh, they start putting up Christmas stuff like in July. Of course it's become commercialized. You know, but, and, then, and then in the, the, what is the saying, like the hustle and the bustle of the season? I mean, you got a lot of stuff going on. I think you could categorize almost everything in your Christmas season into one of these three categories. Parties, so you got, got a lot of parties, church parties, family get-togethers, work parties. Come on, you got all these parties. You're, you look at your December calendar, and it, it's wild. Um, presents, so we're, we're very, very busy you know, I mean, now thankfully online shopping has kind of taken away from the terror of Black Friday shopping. You know, like, I mean, remember back in the day where people literally, they would beat you up over a television. Go, ain't nobody got time for that. All right, but, but now you, you're trying to find the, the right present and so you're looking because you just got to make sure there's that one, one thing. And let me pause right here. And I know there's teenagers in the room. You're going to disagree with this. But let me just tell you. Moms and dads, what your children really need is more of your presence and less of actual presence. That's really what they're looking for. Now, I know I got one kid, he's like, amen and an iPhone. Amen and. But at the end of the day, like, uh, that gift that you're trying to buy to really prove how much they mean to you and care about you, you could show that in so many other ways than going into unnecessary debt. Okay, I digress. So you, you got parties, you got presents, and then you got people. So you've got these get-togethers. You got family, even the dysfunctional ones, right? You got family, you got church, you got work. And so you've got all these things that are going on. You got a decorating, and you got shopping, and you got hot chocolate. And then my weakness, I just, it's good. The Bible talks about confessing your sins one to another, uh, you got them little Debbie Christmas tree cake. My God, I felt the Holy Ghost when I said that out loud. You know, uh, there, there's a kind gentleman uh, that's a part of this campus here that, that works for, for little Debbie and her ministry. And uh, God, God bless her and her anointing that is on her life to provide for us fresh manna from heaven during the holiday. He, Y'all, he delivered two boxes, two bo- not little boxes, like jumbo cardboard boxes of Little Debbie Christmas tree cakes. And now Little Debbie has become Little Diabetes in my life, and uh, <laughs> I love it. You know, so we got all these, all these things, and we're going. And the irony, though, is this, is that because I've even preached, like, you know, that's not the reason of the season, and that is not the reason, but those things are certainly a part of the reason. Like, I, I, I think one of the purposes of Christmas is that it actually is a massive celebration God wants you to celebrate. God wants you to be around people. God wants you to enjoy the parties. I mean, uh, God wants you to, to exchange presents and gifts. I mean, on that Christmas, that first Christmas, they brought gold, frankincense, and myrrh. And they want, he wants you to be a part of those things. But, but what you can't do and what you can't afford to do is get your eyes on those things as if they are the thing. Those things are not the thing. Jesus is the thing. He's the main thing. Those are ways, though, that we celebrate Jesus. Does that make sense? So all of this, I mean, you should watch Hallmark, even though they're the exact same plot (laughs) over and over. Come on, I'm just waiting for the day that in Hallmark, somebody ends up dead somehow. You know, like, let's 
let's mix this thing up a little bit. But it's not. It's always going to be a flannel shirt, a single woman, ending up at a Christmas tree farm trying to save her family's little business. <laughs> it's just always the same, you know? It's, and then all that is great because Christmas is a celebration. You read this in verse 10. Look, the angel of the Lord said to them, don't be afraid. I bring you good news. I mean, how can you not get good news and choose not to celebrate? This is good news. That's what makes this a party. And, and that good news causes you great joy. And again, it's for all of us. So as you go through the busyness of the season, enjoy it all, take it all in, but just be reminded of why. Of why. It's not the what, it's the why. And the why is it's a celebration. Christmas is a celebration. And I'll tell you three things that you get to celebrate. So as you enjoy this season, as you should, celebrate these three things. Number one, we get to celebrate the fact that God loves you. He loves me. Now, I don't know what that does for your heart, but that's a pretty big deal for me because there are days that I don't even love me. I'm, I'm really glad nobody said amen, like amen. There are days I don't love you either. But aren't there days that we are hard to love? But God, God loves us in spite of us. God's love is literally unconditional love. That blows me away. So, so every time I have my second or third little Debbie, it's God loves me, Kimberly. I have to celebrate this way. <laughs> there is no other way. Thank you, Jesus. When you read the Bible from Genesis to Revelation, you, you know what we learn? We learn that God is love. And the Bible never one time says that God has love. The Bible says over and over that he is love. That love is his character. That love is his nature. And, and what, what way did he show it? Uh, there's an, I don't know of a, a, a more perfect scripture to really define or exemplify just how much God loves us. That God, let's make it personal, that God so loved you, he so loved you, that he would give his one and only son so that if you would just believe in him, you'd get eternal, everlasting life. You never perish, but you get eternal life. We get this question a lot in the big C church, not just at Go Church, but just in church. Why am I alive? What's my purpose? Why am I created? And obviously, we could talk about gifts and talents and future and plans and, 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 and. But at the end of the day, God created you so he could love you. Ladies and gentlemen, you are an object of God's love. And he created you to love you. Now, someone here, you're already thinking, you have no idea all that I've done in my life. There is no way that God could love me. All of my past, all of my mistakes, all of my mess ups, all of my issues. But how many of you could testify just like I could? If God can love me, God can love anybody. Come on, like if God can choose to love me, and he can love anybody. But here's the good news is this, is that God's love for you is not based on what you do or what you don't do. God's love is based on who he is. So this isn't on the screen, but if you're taking notes, write it down this way. Uh, God's love is based on his person, not on your performance. So, so there, there is nothing that you could do to lose God's love, and there's nothing you could do to, to make God love you anymore. God loves you. Um, actually, I'm thankful the Holy Spirit reminded me of this. Romans chapter eight, uh, verse, beginning in verse number 37, the Bible talks about how much, how much God loves us. But in all these things, we are overwhelmingly conquering through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come. I wish somebody would help me preach this word right here. Nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. God created you to love you. And listen to me, don't, don't miss this. God loves you on your bad days as much as he loves you on your good days. God loves you when you feel it, and God loves you when you don't feel it. God loves you when you think you deserve it, and God loves you when you realize you don't deserve it. 
but he loves us and he created us so that he could love us. So this is why we celebrate Christmas, that God would, would send his son Jesus, the most significant event in the history of the world, that his birth literally ripped our calendar in half, B.C. to A.D., A.D. to B.C. You see that? That he loves us that much, that much. And nothing you could do could ever make him stop loving you or love you anymore. It reminds me of the little story of, of a boy who grew up in like this little western town years and years and years ago. And he's out riding a horse one day and, and the horse goes crazy, the horse goes wild and he's not able to control the horse and so the horse is just running off and the little boy is on, on the back of the horse and he's, he's pulling the reins, trying to control the horse and bit in mouth, and, but the horse is just, and the horse is running towards a cliff. Well, obviously, if they can't get control, the horse will run right off the cliff and the horse and the little boy will die. Well, here comes an old cowboy. Cowboy hat, lasso in hand, jumps on his horse, chases down the runaway horse, lassos the horse and rescues and saves the boy. Well, some years later, this little boy grows up to be a really bad man. In his life, he's made bad decisions and he has uh, you know, been a criminal and he gets arrested. He's thrown in jail and he's waiting trial. He's gonna go to court where he's gonna stand before a judge. And on his court date, he walks into the courtroom. He stands before the judge. He looks at a judge who is older but looks familiar. Where do I know him from? And then the, that man who was once a boy realizes that judge was that cowboy all those years ago that saved me. So he begins to plead his case. He says, Judge, I don't know if you remember, but I was, I was that little boy. I was that little boy on that runaway horse and you came and you saved me, do you remember? And the judge says, I do remember. And he says, please, will, will you help me? Like, will you get me out of this, you know? And the judge said these words. He says, son, then I was your savior. Today I am your judge. And listen to me. You don't have to worry about, and we'll talk about this in just a minute. You don't have to worry about God punishing you and God's out to get you. No, God sent Jesus to save you. Why? Because he loves you. That's why it's a celebration. And then also we get to celebrate because God is with us. And I know, again, this sounds very like cheesy, but Christmas is about presents, but not the ones that we give and buy and exchange. It's about God's presence, his presence with us. I mean, it's, it's in his very name that he is Emmanuel. Matthew chapter one, verse 23, the virgin will conceive and give birth to a son. They will call him. On the count of three, everybody say his name, Emmanuel. One, two, three, Emmanuel. And what does his name mean? God with us. And then he goes on and, and he says that in my nature, in my character, in my sovereignty, who I am, watch what he says in Hebrews 13, five. And guess what? I'll never leave you. I'll never abandon you. I, I will be with you. And, and here's what I've learned, not only as, as like a pastor, but personally. So not just like pastorally, but personally. So much of our view of our heavenly father is based out of our relationship and view with our earthly dad. A lot of it. So for some of you, it, it has been a parent that has left you or abandoned you, or maybe even a spouse that you exchanged wedding vows and then you ended up in divorce. They walked out and so in your mind you think, yeah, 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 other people have made this promise that they never leave me or abandon me, but here I am. But let me tell you, God will never lie. All of his promises are yes and amen. And God will always be there. He will never walk out on you. And even in the times when you feel like you're all by yourself, I need 100 people who can testify to this truth. Even when you feel like you're alone, God is right there. And he's got his big arms, his Holy Spirit, and he wraps those arms around us and he comforts us in our weakness. And if you grew up in church or maybe you're from a, a family that's got a really solid faith foundation, you can go back to that childhood home or to your grandparents' home, and somewhere in that house is like the, the poem in a picture frame, Footprints in the Sand. How many of you know that, that poem, like Footprints in the Sand? And every time you went into Granny's house, you used the bathroom, it's like Footprints in the Sand, right above the commode, it's just staring at you. And that, that poem is simply this, that you know, the, the, the writer talks about walking along the, the, the shore of a beach and noticing that there are two sets of footprints, one, being yours and then the other being God's. And then, and then times come, storms come, the waves come, and then you look back, there's only one set of footprints, and we've all done this. God, why, 
Why in those difficult times did you leave me? Why did I walk alone? Well, the poem goes on to say, which backs up exactly what scripture reveals and teaches, that in those difficult times, God didn't leave you. God didn't abandon you. God picked your tail up. Come on, I don't think the poem said it that way. Um, But God picked you up and God carried you in your brokenness. Come on, God carried you in your weakness. It was God in his comfort, in his sovereignty, that you couldn't take it. You couldn't take another step, yet God picked you up and took the steps for you. He's worthy of praise. Come on. And watch this. And it seems like during Christmas, like from Thanksgiving to the new year, the enemy is working overtime. He's like working double time to increase your anxiety, to increase your fear, to increase your stress, to increase worry. Man, I mean, this is like factual, statistically. I'm not making this up. In the holiday season, depression skyrockets. Anxiety skyrockets. Suicide skyrockets. I'm gonna gonna pause right here. I I, I don't know if I'll do this all day, but I feel led to do it in this moment. If you're here today and you feel suicidal, listen to me, You, you will not die, you will live. God loves you unconditionally and God is with you and God sees you right where you are and you mean a whole lot to people. But even more than you mean to people, you mean a lot to God. Look at me, don't you take your life. Don't you take your life. You get the help that you need, you get the counsel you need, you get the comfort that you need, but you will, I prophetically speak this, you will not die, you will live. Come on, you will live. It's the primary objective of the enemy though. The enemy wants, what's the the goal of the devil? Steal, kill, destroy. And it's like in this season, all of it is so increased. People are having panic attacks and they're so worried and fearful. And yet God just simply says, I'm with you. You you can carry that, but you don't have to carry that. First Peter 5, 7, cast all your cares on him because he cares for you. And listen, I wish it was just as simple as, you don't have to carry it, give it to God. But you don't have to carry it. You can give it to God. And I see people so afraid and frantic. And you, you know what you do? And I'm saying this generally. But you know what we do? Uh, we mask our fear and anxiety and panic in all of the extracurriculars of Christmas to try to hide that pain or to try to hide that fear. Do you know in the Bible... From Genesis to Revelation, there are 365 phrases that say, fear not. How many days are in the year? 365. Come on, Noonan, let's go. 365 days, 365 fear not phrases. There is one fear not for every single day of your year. Come on, you don't have to be afraid. And here's what I've learned. Because Emmanuel, God is with me, that when God is near, he removes all my fear. I don't have to be fearful. I don't have to be afraid. And listen, this is why my own personal story, my own place of victory, I get to celebrate. Because God has brought me a mighty long way. Anybody with me on that? I got, I got a way to go, but he's brought me a long way from where I've been. And so I celebrate because God loves me, but God is also with me. And then the third one is this. Are you being encouraged? I just want to encourage you today. It's good news, great joy for all people. God loves me. God is with me. And watch this. God is for me. I told you a moment ago, a lot of people view their heavenly father based off of their relationship with their earthly dad. And some of y'all didn't have a great relationship with your dad. Um, I, I wanna be guarded and careful here, but perhaps he was very much a disciplinarian. Uh, verbally, physically, whatever. And so in your mind, you're like, I mean, if that's how a heavenly father is, I don't want anything to do with that because I dealt with that. So I don't want anything to do with that. But honestly, God God is not that. I told you the story. Today, he's your savior. One day, he'll judge you, but today is the day of salvation. But a lot of people are afraid to get close to God because they're afraid, if I get close to God, he'll punish me, he'll spank me, he'll scold me. If I get close to God, he'll pull out that list of all the things that I've done wrong. Uh, He'll remind me of my past. At the end of the day, though, listen to me, God, 
God is for you. Do you know who your biggest cheerleader is? It is God. God wants you to win. God wants you to be successful. God wants you to have the victory. God wants you to have joy. God want, do, you, do you get that? Like God, God is not out to get you. The devil is out to get you. It's not God. It's the enemy who's, who's causing all of the turmoil and the, the storms. I hope you understand that. Like God, Jesus, God didn't send Jesus to scold you. He sent him to save you. He just wants a personal and growing relationship with you. He wants to be Lord. I mean, it's what we, we talk, John 3, 16. The very next verse is John 3, 17. And most of us can memorize John 3, 16, but you need to lock in John 3, 17, just like John 3, 16, because it reveals this very fact. For God so loved the world, he gave his one and only begotten son that whosoever would believe it in him would not perish but have everlasting eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn it, but to save it. So you know what the enemy does though? Every time you mess up, every time I mess up, every time I lose my way or I, I fail to this flesh, right? The enemy immediately starts with guilt and condemnation. Do you know why? Because condemnation separates you from God. So the enemy's, his, his whole goal is, I'll just condemn you. I'll, I'll beat you with guilt. And I'll make you think that it, it's God. So that you're just like, I don't want anything, I don't want anything, to, I don't want to get scolded, I don't want to be spanked, I don't want to be beat. But at the end of the day, that's not, that's not what the Lord wants. He wants to save you. Uh, the Bible says that it is not the will of the Father that any man would perish, but that all would come to repentance. He wants to save you in his grace and in his mercy. And so he loves you so much, he, he died on a cross. Now, what, what God will do through the Holy Spirit is never condemnation, but you better believe it will be conviction. The Holy Spirit will convict you because while condemnation separates you from God, conviction draws you close to God. Oh, can I get an amen? Come on, like, you feel convicted, you take a step closer to God. At the end of the day, look, Jesus, he's not coming to spank you. He's coming to save you. So the question is, have you experienced the joy of salvation? The celebration of Christmas? Because again, until you get that, you'll try to find all the other things in this world hoping that that will bring you fulfillment, and it won't. Those things, those people, no. Ooh. Here's what the Word says in Philippians 4, that God will supply all of your needs. So whatever it is that your heart is looking for on December the 10th, 2023, and this Christmas season, you can only find it in God. You can't find it in anything else in this world, only in God, and that's why we celebrate, because God loves me. God is with me, and he's for me. And so for that, we celebrate and we say, thank you, Jesus. Come on, everybody, put your hands together for about five seconds here. <laughs> Heads bowed, eyes closed, just for a moment. What's the Holy Spirit speaking to your heart? And what's your next step on this faith journey? I don't want you to go anywhere just yet, because when you leave, you go right back into all the busyness of the season. Let's just take a minute. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Let's set uh, an atmosphere of worship. Thank you, Jesus.